The clothing industry has been a source of horrific injuries and deaths. One jumps to mind is the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, or even the general hellscape that an industrial revolution era factory was to work in. These are all from Western industries. Over the years, workers' rights and employment standards have rightly improved to the point of industrial disasters being kind of rare and not running into the multiple hundreds of victims. All good, but sadly the poor working conditions linked to fashion has just been pushed out to the third world. More desperate economic conditions of some countries has allowed employers to exploit the safety of their staff. Much like how it was in the UK about a hundred or so years ago. Well, couple this with poor building regulations and you've got a recipe for disasters running into the multiple hundreds of victims. Well, today's subject will well and truly smash the ball out of the park for victim count as well over a thousand would lose their lives with a couple more thousand injured. Today we're looking at the Rana Plaza collapse, aka the deadliest garment factory disaster in history. And what's more, it didn't happen in the 18 or 1910s, but the 2010s, just 11 years ago. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Before we start, I need to say that our story today is a structural failure and almost right from the start you'll be banging your head with the level of idiocy displayed during the building's construction operation. But the most important thing is that of the victims who had no choice but to work in such a shoddy building. Clothing from Bangladesh is a very common thing, well at least here in the UK with companies such as Primark sourcing many of their clothing from Bangladesh. Regrettably, I have even got some in my wardrobe myself. The building. This was the Rana Plaza. It was a concrete and steel structure, originally built in 2006 as a four-storey building intended for shopping and office spaces. It was not built with the correct permits for the time and made use of a poorly loose-filled pond as a corner of the building's foundations accounting for 60% of the building's footings. The first floors were built with supporting walls. However, the area around the Rana Plaza in Savar, Bangladesh started to be used in the garment industry. As such, the plaza was beginning to be seen as a place to house garment factories. This came with some issues, and that was weight. You see, shops and offices are much lighter in terms of building wear and tear than a factory, which would house much heavier and more vibrating machinery. However, more money could be made if the building was adapted for factory use. The building was commissioned and built by Mohammed Sohel Rana and his dad, Abdul Kalik. Now, the building was constructed without full permission, but this wasn't such a big deal, as Sohel reportedly had links with the ruling party in Bangladesh, the Awami League. Friends in high places get you everywhere, even more so if you want to add some more levels to your sketchy building. Starting in 2008, a fifth floor was added, which bizarrely omitted its supporting walls, which were used on the first to fourth floors, instead just relying on the building's columns for its support. Over the next couple of years, a few more floors were added, again without proper support. Garment factories were added as the building rose, putting excessive strain on the structure. The building's original architect would later state to reporters, as noted in an architects.com report. We did not design it for industrial use. At that time, the garment area was not there. There was no demand for industrial buildings. If I had known that it was to be an industrial building, as per the rules, I would have taken other measures for the building. So floor occupants were as follows. The first floor was home to a shopping area and a bank. Next between levels two and seven was multiple different textiles and clothing manufacturing companies, all of which would require heavy and very sketchy shaky generators, of which there were four in the plaza. Now building a building whilst overloading it with machinery it wasn't designed for might seem like a bad idea. Well, it seems like it is because it is a bad idea. So it's time to dig out your bingo card as after these advertisements we will be getting into the disaster. The disaster. It is the 23rd of April 2013 and the Rana Plaza is not looking good. It's currently being evacuated. 
Some workers and staff have also refused to enter the building. Why, you might ask? Well, one thing you don't want to see in your building has just appeared, and that is cracks. And not just small superficial, normal cracks in plaster, but severe structural cracks. Man, I said cracks quite a lot there. Well, closing down the building is the safe and right thing to do, but it would affect the factory owners and ultimately building owner Sohel Rana's bottom line. The concerning state of the building was reported to a local news team, but building owner Sohil Rana insisted that the building was safe. As part of this announcement, he also made it clear that workers would be expected to return the next day for work. Now, many workers didn't really have a choice. The option was to return or get fired. This isn't really the best prospect for many, but in Bangladesh, where poverty rates are high, it's even worse. And add to one last bit of salt for the wound was many were owed a few weeks of salary, which if fired becomes almost impossible to reclaim. Essentially, it was a financial gun against your head. It is the Wednesday of the 24th of April 2013, the next day, and workers have reluctantly returned to work at their respective factories within the Rana Plaza. There are an estimated between 3,122 and 3,700 people working on the building's nine floors. In the morning, there had been a power cut, and as like many other buildings in the area, backup diesel generators are fired into life. The building was vibrating with the thrum of the generators. At 8.54am, the vibrations turned into a cracking and rumbling sound from the higher floors. Within minutes, the entire nine-storey building collapsed into the ground, only leaving the lowest floor standing. Also, an adjoining three-storey building collapsed as well. As the dust settled, the sheer amount of destruction could be seen by anyone near the building. Thousands were trapped beneath the rubble. Some managed to scrabble out of the wrecked building, passers-by rushed in to help. Search parties of firefighters, soldiers, ambulance crews, as well as untold numbers of civilian and family members, scoured through the rubble for the next few weeks. The search would last up until the 13th of May. Local cranes were shipped in to help remove rubble. During the rescue attempts, a couple of accidental fires were started. Unfortunately, due to the nature of the factories inside, even the smallest of sparks from rescue cutting equipment could ignite the hundreds of tons of fabric strewn about the wreckage. Because of this, a number of firefighters were injured during the recovery efforts. During the rescue, clashes between locals and police would raise tensions, as many perceived the rescue efforts to be too slow. One occasion would result in rubber bullets being fired. In total, an estimated 1,134 people died in the rubble, many from the collapse, but others from being trapped for so long, which sounds like a horrific way to go. On top of that, there were, again, an estimated over 2,500 people injured to varying degrees. The collapse would go down as the worst modern-day fashion-related disaster, as well as one of the worst building disasters in modern history. The price of greed was paid in blood, to which the cause had to be found out. After the collapse, the whole world would be watching, and the culprits would have to be discovered. Aftermath the rubble was poured over for clues as to how the building could have collapsed. It wouldn't take long to find out that it was poorly built on unstable land and using the worst kind of materials. On top of that, it was pretty easy to piece together, especially with the day before the building exhibiting such severe cracking. The history of Rana's land grab of the pond and improper foundations came to light, and it followed a story very sadly all too common in Bangladesh. Reportedly, even the country's Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association had built its headquarters on land without planning permission, as noted in Lib.com's House of Cards, the Savar Building Collapse report. Things would not be looking good for the building's owner, Sohil Rana, as on the 28th of April 2013, he was arrested near the Indian border. Witnesses would report that the building would always rumble and shake when the generators came on, and with the cracks appearing the day before the collapse, disaster was just a matter of time before the house of cards Rana had constructed would fail. The community was very angry, understandably. So, as noted in a BBC News article, he entered the court wearing a bulletproof vest and helmet and faced angry crowds chanting, hang him, hang him. 
So Hill represented the thuggishness of the cowboy industry of building development prevalent in the country, with accusations of land grabbing, corruption and bribery. He will be sentenced to jail time, but not for the collapse of the building, but for corruption, on the 29th of August 2017. He would serve three years, his murder trial would be paused while serving. The trial would resume in February 2022, but he was granted bail in 2023. Interestingly, Sohill had spent the best part of a decade behind bars on remand awaiting his trial. The international community will come out with the usual platitudes, but the need for cheap fashion has continued in proper building and working conditions for garment workers all across the world. Little compensation was made available for the victims' families. Primark, one of the customers of the factories, offered $200 per victim, but only if DNA proof could be given of the victim they were claiming for. Other payouts would come for the victims, but at the time of writing this script, several families remain uncompensated. So it's scale time. It's going to be a nine or mega death. This is due to the body count and this is what I've got for the bingo card. Do you agree? This is a Plain Foot production. All videos on the channel create a commons attribution share alike license. Plain Foot videos produce on me John in the currently cold corner of southern London UK. I have a second YouTube channel so check them out for all sorts of odds and sods as well as Instagram and Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. I have financial backers on Patreon and YouTube memberships so thank you very much and also thank you for the rest of you for tuning in every week to watch my videos and listen to me talk and all that's left to say is thank you for watching and Mr Music play us out please. <laughs>